In every moment, you choose how you want to live your life and who you want to be. It is your ultimate power and your inescapable responsibility. You are the master of your reality. But it doesn't always feel that way. Too often, we believe the awful fictions of our fears. Uh, we surrender to our self-limitations. We misperceive strength and weakness, uh, misperceive success and luck. We perpetuate our insecurities and vanities, and we can fail to listen to ourselves and to our own hearts. How do we take back control, uh, creating the lives we want with awareness and accountability at home and at work? That's the question we explore in this interview series, Mastering Your Reality. We'll explore the question with remarkable people who clearly have a lot to teach us on the subject. Today's guest is one such person. Dan Rome is the definitive expert on visualization for the business world. He's the author of the wildly popular groundbreaking book, The Back of the Napkin, an international bestseller, and a bunch of other great books too, like Blah Blah Blah, uh, Draw to Win, and Show and Tell. Dan, thank you so much for being here with us. Isaac, it is an incredible pleasure to be able to share some of this with you as conversations we've had before. I look forward to it. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. So I am going to make an assumption, even though I just sort of, you know, even though I always counsel against making assumptions, I'm going to make an assumption that uh, would you agree or disagree, kind of taking control, creative thinking, uh, awareness and intention, a lot of that has to do with sort of visualizing, the process of sort of imagining, visualizing, kind of seeing what we want to accomplish. I think it absolutely does. And I think, Isaac, it's interesting because I do spend a lot of time in the corporate world, both in the United States and happily, interestingly, abroad over the last several years. And consistently, one of the things that you hear from business leaders is they need to have a vision and to the point where we need to have a vision statement. And what I find so ironic is that we appreciate this idea of a vision and of clearly what we mean is something in mind. Where do we imagine our company is going? What does that look like? And yet we rarely express it in any kind of visual terms. It ends up being something as, as terrible as, you know, uh, leveraging synergies to maximize shareholder value, <laughs> which is as far from a visual as you can possibly get because I have no idea what that means. So yes, to answer your question, to me, I think being able to see in my mind's eye in the greatest level of resolution possible, what does my end state look like? Whether I'm actually going to achieve it or not is irrelevant, but if I can imagine what it will look like, then I feel comfortable embarking on the path. And I've got to believe that's true for many people. Could the challenge uh, in, in accomplishing this have anything to do with a fox and a hummingbird? And if so, could you explain? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So I was uh, working on a book a few years ago, exactly to the point we're discussing, where I think that many people in the business world get so caught up in our verbiage and our, our lingo and our techno speak and our business mumbo jumbo that at some point we actually forget what it was that we were trying to talk about. And so I wanted to come up with a powerful sort of a visual analogy for that. And I thought, well, you know, we talk about right brain and left brain thinking. And yeah, a lot of it has been debunked. It is not true that half of our brain is creative and half of our brain is analytic. It's, it's obviously far more nuanced and complicated than that. But it is also true that I think within all of us, there is an idea that I have a creative side and I have a more analytic side. And what I've done is I've kind of spun that a little bit deeper into some of the cognitive science about how does the visual process actually work all the way from our retina into our visual neocortex and how does a lot of verbal communication work from a cognitive perspective. Uh, and I thought an interesting model would be to imagine that the world around us is kind of a forest and it's very complicated and sometimes it's very dark. It's perhaps poorly illuminated. It's full of the trees and the forest mm -hmm. and there's a lot in our way. Well, if you imagine it, one part of our brain I think is more like a fox and I would call that more our verbal approach to things, which is by definition quite clever and very linear. That is the fox I think looks at the forest in a kind of a point A to point B to point C to point D model, sort of walking through the forest, identifying each tree or each obstacle one by one, and then creating a kind of a, 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 a mental image of the possession, of the position of those objects, and then unfurling that in the form of a verbal statement. So 
I walk forward 10 feet, I see a tree, and that tree doesn't have to be a tree. This is a metaphor, of course, it could be anything. And then I take a turn to the right, and I go four steps to the right, and then I come to position B, and so on. And that becomes our typical kind of a business outline, A, B, C, D, very linear. Great. And that is an incredibly powerful way of communicating and organizing our thoughts. But it doesn't account for the other part of our mind that would like to kind of fly through the forest very quickly, bouncing off of everything, or fly above it, and kind of get this more holistic view of this is the whole forest. And that, to me, is more the hummingbird side. And I, I use the hummingbird as the analogy. I live out here in California, and uh, we have hummingbirds that live around us pretty much all year round. And uh, you know, they're incredible little creatures. This is a tiny little bird. I'm sure people are familiar with a hummingbird. It's no more than a couple of inches in length. This is the only bird that can actually fly backwards and upside down. And if you've ever had a chance to be around a hummingbird, you realize they don't go from point A to B to C to D, as our clever fox did. A hummingbird is, in effect, in all of those positions at the same time. It moves... <laughs> I exaggerate a little. It moves beyond the speed of light and is in nine places at the same time, which to me is kind of like our mind's eye, where it can be very difficult to tone it down. It wants to see the whole picture all at once. And because it doesn't really have the verbal ability to slow it down, uh, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just a different view. So long answer, Isaac. I think that it takes a combination of the two. Do I see the forest? And do I see the trees? Mm -hmm. And it's only by bringing the two of them together that I actually can navigate my way through the forest of, of life. Does and that make the, sense? And by default, it's easier for the one to kind of drown out or overwhelm the other. Well, yes. And we do know enough about uh, the verbal mind versus the visual mind. And I'm it's so incredibly intrigued by your take on this <laughs> that the verbal mind always tries to, tries to take credit for the narratives that unfold in our mind. The, the verbal mind, because it has words, says, oh, I'm, I'm the owner, I own the idea. But we know that that is not true, or that is only partially true, uh, that it is our ability, this incredible horsepower we have to see things either with our eyes or with our in our mind's eye that doesn't require words. It's a completely different experience. It's kind of like the verbal mind is the PR team. Exactly right. Or, or you could say sometimes they're the spin meisters, you know, absolutely. So we've, we've got this complicated story and it's our job to spin it in a way that makes sense. Well, good for them. But sometimes I don't need it to make sense in that way. There is value in grokking the bigger picture, even pre-verbally. Well, what do you think about that? that? I mean, given given your situation, does this make any sense? How does this resonate with you? So it resonates tremendously with me. It's interesting because so what I'm thinking about here is you talk about um, visualization in terms of sort of the, the 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 neuroscience of what's going on between the eye and the visual cortex, which is something that I also find very fascinating and have written about and talk about. But uh, what uh, what I'm you know, what's uh, more relevant for me these days is all the linkages, all the things that go on between the visual cortex uh, and sort of higher level cognitive processing in the brain. Uh, so, you know, the visual cortex is in many ways um, the sort of air traffic controller for uh, memories, opinions, emotions, uh, conceptual understanding of, uh, of, of our environment or even, you know, or, or even ideas. Um, and we are inherently visual creatures and I mean it in a way that has nothing to do with sight. So yeah. if, if for me in a weird way, and I don't, you know, tell me if I'm going too far here, but, um, I think we experience sight as something that's more Fox-like. We think it's pretty straightforward, ordered, rational, objective, systematic. Uh, but I think the truth of the matter is, um, even the experience of sight, and certainly any notion of sort of visualizing as human beings is, is, is all hummingbird. Like there's a lot of stuff going on. Absolutely. And isn't it funny because, Isaac, I want to layer in a thought there. If you, if you think about the typical – back to your original question about sort of entering into corporate America. Yes. And I'm very curious about how this would matter in, in the law, a field that you're very, very familiar with where you know we talk about the letter of the law and a good lawyer – 
uh, again, almost by de definition, is someone who's going to be a good verbal communicator, forcing complicated situations. I mean, what happens in a courtroom, in my estimation, is taking a complex who did what to whom when, why, how, in what circumstances, et cetera. It is a complicated, nuanced cloud of information and kind of forcing it into a single linear pipe with an A, a B, and a and then, which triggered a this, which caused a that, which gives us the conclusion, right or wrong. That's my kind of interpretation of the law. Is that a reasonable take on what happened? I think so. It's interesting, though, because in a sense, you know, you could say maybe that the same for the same, you know, sticking with the, the sort of metaphor of the, of the fox and the bird in the forest, you know, for any given forest that we might, you know, explore sort of fully and richly as a hummingbird or whatever, uh, with a lawyer, the fox or whatever, is going to chart a course, a very specific, precise course through that forest that will um, sort of precisely manage the experience, maybe obscure certain aspects of it, highlight certain aspects of it, hide entirely other aspects of it, um, and basically create a walk through the forest that uh, uh, is, is, you know, assuming that it's an ethical lawyer is, is not um, inaccurate or, or sort of intentionally false or misleading, but certainly is um, one perspective. This is my path through this forest, and I'd like you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury and judge, to see my path and agree with it as well. And pay, pay you know, no I think attention is, to the uh, roiling uh, river over there. <laughs> yeah, that that is that is uh, immaterial to yes. my path. <laughs> yeah, so that the sound of the babbling brook disregard that one. Well, and so Isaac, I think what's fascinating is in the business world, in the boardroom, in the meeting room. For reasons that would take far more time than we have right now, but I think are really fascinating to explore, there is, without a doubt, a tremendous uh, predominance of the fox. Mm -hmm. That is what we are trained to do, and, and therefore, almost by definition, the people who typically do well in management or executive levels in business tend to be, there are many exceptions, but tend to be the people who can explain their way very well out of a box. Now, there are many exceptions, and I think about people like Sir Richard Branson, mm -hmm. who uh, acknowledges being wildly dyslexic and having no ability to read a spreadsheet, but clearly a visionary. I think about Charles Schwab, who founded Schwab Investments here in San Francisco, who you know later on in life founded schools for people with dyslexia because he, he recognized his own massive struggle trying to get through business school. Mm -hmm not being able to read and write reports in the way that people normally did. So what I'd like to try to encourage is for those of us who may be a little bit more humming like hummingbird like naturally to uh, try to find ways to put ourselves in positions of power. And for those people who are more fox like to give some credence to the wild, wacky people over there at the side of the table who just aren't getting it, who may be more seeing the forest than the trees. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I really think that that's an important thing to do. We talk about diversity in the workplace, and that means a thousand different things. And in my mind, one of the critical paths of diversity is making sure that we have people who simply think differently, uh, who are being heard, because it's when we put all the different voices together that we get the, the outcome that is the most likely to succeed every single time. No, no doubt that a uh, diversity of um, perspectives and ideas, for, you know, engenders uh, better outcomes. And, and and in this case, I I would like to say, uh, you know, we we all take diversity in many many different ways. Um, I would like to encourage diversity of thinking in, hey, let's make space for the hummingbird people in the room who typically are so flighty that we don't give them much space. We kind of discount them and because they do have something to contribute. And sometimes it's not that they're not getting it. It's that they're getting it and a lot more than it. Well, and that also, as a bit of a hummingbird person myself. <laughs> I never would have guessed. <laughs> well, that is exactly, in a way, my handicap, if you will, is that I often see so many angles to the same problem at the same time that the hard part is slowing down the brain enough to explain it in a way that someone else will see it. And I often think what happens is the more hummingbird-like, the more truly sort of visual, uh, mind's eye, fully lit up people sometimes struggle to communicate well 
because, because the, the brain, brain is going, going so fast. fast. Uh, and, and that's, that's where I think there's a challenge for us. And, and Isaac, think at the, the risk of going on, I wanted to just add one more thought to I thought it was a, a, a beautiful way you introduced the whole series. The realities that we create ourselves that are often based on our own fears and worries. And I want to just say this. This is kind of deeply personal, and, but, but I'm just going to say it quickly. Uh, I now make most of my money in my career as a paid public speaker. Okay, I do keynotes and I do training, uh, and and I will admit that it is something that did not come easy to me. In fact, uh, I don't uh, stage fright for a long time was a real terrorizing idea, and the way multiple ways I've gotten around it to where now I love getting up in front of a group of people. I mean, you can't stop me. Uh, but that was not an easy path to go to. I don't think there are many people who are natural born presenters. I think it's a learned skill. And in my case, this is the comment I wanted to make. The reason I love visualizing things is because I do try to do a sort of a memory palace-ish approach. If I'm going to give a speech, if I can see a roadmap of the speech in my mind's eye, because in my case, I drew it out, but I imagine if someone's not a drawer, they could do it in their mind's eye. And that that's what I fall back upon because I realized the fear, the fear of limitation was, well, what if I forget my next line? When you have a good image in mind of the story arc you want to deliver, if you forget a line, who cares? Because you can always go back to the picture in your mind and say, oh, that's where I'm going. I can just pick it up. I, I, I'm a terrible joke teller, but I'm a great storyteller because I can see the arc. And, and in telling a story, unlike a joke, you don't have to get everything right in order and the story still holds. Does that make any sense? It makes great sense to me. I'll, I'll, I'll share on the, on the subject of stories and jokes and public speaking and fears. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fond of, uh, of, of uh, letting you sighted people know that sighted people – are terrified of speaking to big crowds, but blind people are terrified of speaking to empty rooms. Uh, think about it. You know, our our uh, <laughs> our concern is uh, nobody's there listening. So, um, I think the blind perspective is an interesting one too that should be uh, should be embraced in the in the boardroom. Oh, I, I, it's, it absolutely must because I, I'm well. I don't know, but it, given the fact that I've spent the last twenty years of my career focusing on vision, I'm so delighted that you we have a chance to speak because I'm using you increasingly for data points to enrich in my own understanding by what happens with someone who's in your circumstance who did see in, you know, with your eyes, but no longer does. I think it's a fascinating thing. I want to talk more about that because I know there's cool stuff there. Well, let, let's do this again. I absolutely. Anytime. Awesome. Well, I love it. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, we'll leave it here for now, but I could talk to you, uh, you know, all day and all night. So I really appreciate your taking, uh, Time to join me. Isaac, it is my pleasure, and let's do it again. Thank awesome. you.